Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India An action potential is an exciting phenomenon and literally at that a nerve cell say that is an axon has a negative resting membrane potential. Suppose this is a sensory neuron when you touch that touch sensory neuron will be excited and transmit the sensation of touch to your cortex so that you realize that you are being touched. And the way touch excites the sensory neuron is by inducing an action potential or by changing the membrane potential to a positive potential for a very brief period. So, an action potential is a brief period of positivity inside the cell at the local point where you are being touched. An action potential that develops there quickly resolves. The membrane comes back to resting state at that point. Whereas, once that action potential is formed, it induces an action potential in the next part of the nerve and the next part of the nerve and so on till it is ultimately transmitted to the cortex via other neurons. And our question now is how does the membrane become positive inside or what is the cause for the action potential or the upstroke of the action potential. Even before we can get there we will reconsider the statements that were made about the resting membrane potential in the last class because in a standard classroom when I address the students after the lecture on resting membrane potential there are some questions and there are some counter arguments. We will consider them now before we proceed to discuss the action potential per se. At the end of the last class we had come to the conclusion that the resting membrane potential in a nerve cell is because the nerve cell is permeable only to potassium at rest. And that statement also includes the other two statements. If it is permeable only to potassium, it follows that it is impermeable to the other cation and impermeable to the anions thereof. These are the conditionalities where the membrane would reach the potassium equilibrium potential. And if the potassium concentrations are same, again we know that the potassium equilibrium potential would be 0. So, a certain concentration gradient of potassium is required and that is why you get a non-zero equilibrium potential for potassium which the resting membrane is at. Therefore, for a potential difference to exist, the other condition is that there must be a concentration gradient for potassium. Now, some students would counter me now. Now, the po popular answer that I said I would get in a class when I first posed the question as to what the resting membrane potential is due to would be that it is because of large anions within the cell which cannot go across. At that time, the argument was even if we replaced the large anions with small anions for which the membrane had transporters, the potential would still exist and therefore, the idea that the negative membrane potential is due to impermeant anions is incorrect. That was my statement.
But now students would ask me, but that is exactly what you have stated here, that one of the conditions required for the internal negativity is that the membrane is impermeable to anions. That is what we said first. You argued that that was not the case, but now that is exactly a condition that you have stated. Well, what I would have to tell then is that this was not entirely correct not entirely wrong either because just the statement is an insufficient condition. If the membrane was impermeable, impermeable only to the anions but permeable to both the cations, then again there would be no potential difference. They would move in opposite directions and cancel out the potential difference. So, this is an insufficient condition and one statement which would cover everything is that the membrane is permeable only to potassium and impermeable not only to the anions but also to sodium. The next popular answer I would get is I said the stoichiometry of the sodium potassium pump, the pump throwing out 3 cations while taking in only 2 cations. Is that the cause of the negativity inside? And I said that is not the case because even if you inhibited the pump with bubane, the potential difference still existed. Some biologists would not agree with the statement that the sodium potassium pump is not responsible for the resting membrane potential because it is that pump which sets these two conditions for development of that resting potential. It is that pump which makes the membrane essentially impermeable to sodium by throwing out sodium and it is that pump which builds up a potassium concentration gradient. And how can you say that the pump is not responsible for the resting membrane potential? The incorrectness in the concept is that the negativity inside is not because of the stoichiometry, one extra cation going out for every turn of the pump. Even if the stoichiometry was 2 is to 2, the potential difference would exist because the membrane would still be impermeable to sodium and there will be a concentration gradient for potassium. So, it is not the stoichiometry of the pump which is responsible for the internal negativity. The importance of the pump in the internal negativity is that it lays down the conditions necessary for the resting membrane potential. The next question would be, if that was the case, why did the potential not dissipate when bobain was added? This is an important concept to understand. What we first have to understand is that cells have redundant mechanisms for keeping sodium out because keeping sodium out is ever so important for cell survival. It would swell and lies if not for the pump. So if there are, there are reasons for the pump to be inhibited and I suppose there are even endogenous compounds which can inhibit the sodium potassium pump. If the pump is inhibited, other mechanisms of sodium extrusion will take over. The most important one being the sodium calcium exchanger which we have considered earlier and will consider in greater detail when we do the cardiovascular system. So, Addition of wobane does not immediately dissipate the membrane potential because there must be other sodium extrusion mechanisms which will allow that condition to be satisfied. But what about the concentration gradient for potassium? Now, the channels for potassium which are open at rest are very few and it would take a long time for the potassium gradient to dissipate through those 
few channels. And therefore, if therefore while you do not see a gross reduction in membrane potential immediately upon addition of mobane, given time, as the potassium gradient slowly dissipates through the few channels that are open at rest, the potential difference will gradually reduce, the cell will depolarize and reach zero potential when the gradient has dissipated. I hope I have conveyed my understanding of the resting membrane potential sufficiently and you can now reflect upon these phenomena and develop your own understanding of what the resting membrane potential is due to. We have now set the stage to learn about what an action potential is. We can now see with ease what the action potential is due to from the shoulders of giants who have spent entire lifetimes in the laboratory to gift us this understanding. Julius Bernstein from Germany, Hodgkin and Huxley from Great Britain, Kenneth Cole and Curtis from the United States of America are the big players of, in the field who have brought about this understanding of action potential. Even in the last session, we saw that Julius Bernstein had realized as early as 1902 that the resting potential of a cell comes up because the cell membrane is somewhat permeable to potassium and not to sodium. Now that is amazing insight coming at a time when concepts of membrane transporters and ion channels is not yet tangible. Julius Bernstein did not stop there. He was able to measure potential differences across the membrane by using what's called a rheometer. And he found that the internal negativity reduced or dissipated when the membrane was excited. And he said that the action potential or the period of excitation is a period where the membrane breaks down and its resistance decreases. Fantastic insight again. We will try and interpret what Bernstein might have meant from our knowledge about channels today. He was entirely correct in his statement that the resting nerve cell was permeable only to potassium at rest and that's why the cell is at the potassium equilibrium potential. That's what the resting membrane potential is. And when he tried to describe action potential, this is what he might have envisaged, that the membrane resistance decreased or its conductance increased, that it became permeable to all ions. And therefore, he must have thought the membrane completely depolarized, that is, reached zero potential. There's no polarity across the membrane. That's what he must have meant when he said that action potential is a case of membrane breakdown. Or, let me say that he must have thought that there was an increase in permeability to all ions. Now we will see if this theory of membrane breakdown was correct. If it was correct, the consequences of such membrane breakdown, where the membrane became permeable to all ions, would be that there would be an increase in conductance of the membrane, if you can measure it, and there would be complete depolarization. The membrane would reach zero potential. The first of these two questions was addressed by Cole and Curtis. Kenneth Cole used squid as his preparation. The giant axon of the squid has a diameter of about 
1 millimeter and it is easy to place an intracellular electrode. They not only measured voltage from the squid axon, they also measured conductance with a Wheatstone bridge arrangement. Now, the amplitude of this tracing here is a measure of conductance. This figure is now an iconic figure. They noticed that when the voltage changed, the conductance also increased. And as the voltage came back to the normal resting membrane potential, the conductance gradually decreased. So, yes, when there is an action potential, membrane conductance increases as predicted by Bernstein. But this increase in membrane conductance cannot be construed as a membrane breakdown because though we say there was an increase in conductance, the cell membrane still had a large resistance. The membrane conductance, now we know, goes up from somewhere around 1 picosiemens to 40 picosiemens. A 40 times increase in conductance was what was observed. That still tells us the membrane is, has a big resistance. It's not as if it just broke down and allowed all ions to permeate it freely. So even if membrane breakdown as construed by Bernstein did not work out to be an indiscriminate increase in membrane permeability, we still have to answer the question whether all channels opened up, whether the membrane just became non-selective for any ion and that is why there was no internal potential. That is the second question to consider. Now notice that the voltage recording here has no absolute values. But then both the groups, Hodgkin and Huxley and Cole and Curtis, were able to put in fine microelectrodes and they were able to measure absolute voltages within the squid axon. To their great surprise, during an action potential, the voltage did not reach zero and stop there. Depolarization was a term used by Julius Bernstein to say that the membrane lost its polarity, which means it should reach zero potential. But to their big surprise, they, they saw that the membrane overshot the zero mark and went to a positive potential. Now this was a very big surprise. And the question as to why this happened could be answered only after World War II, after a gap of about five to six years. Though the term depolarization would technically mean that the membrane lost its polarity and reached zero, we have continue, continued to use the term to refer to the whole of the upstroke of the action potential. The whole upstroke reaching positivity is now referred to as depolarization. Whereas during an action potential, what actually happens is a reversal of polarity where the cell interior becomes positive, albeit for a very short period of the order of 2 milliseconds. And why does that happen? Hodgkin and Huxley postulated that the internal positivity was because the membrane was selecting for sodium instead of potassium. In today's understanding, this would be opening of sodium channels so that the membrane reached the sodium equilibrium potential during excitation. Now, if the hypothesis that action potential is an attempt by the membrane to reach the sodium equilibrium potential because the membrane has become permeable to sodium, then it follows that if you changed extracellular sodium concentration, say you reduced it to 70, then 
the ratio will decrease and the magnitude of the action potential would be the magnitude of the sodium equilibrium potential as predicted by the Nernst equation would be less and therefore the height of the action potential would be less. So, when you had 140 sodium the action potential that you record say is plus 40. You would notice that it is not equal to the sodium equilibrium potential it is less we will consider why later on. And if you changed external sodium we have to see if the height of the action potential reduces only then we can confirm that the action potential is a case where sodium channels have opened up on the membrane. Hodgkin and Katz did those experiments. They used the squid axon again and as they changed external sodium they used seawater as the extracellular fluid because a marine animal would have an extracellular fluid resembling the seawater of today. A word of caution is that the extracellular fluid in our bodies is not like the seawater of today. It is much more dilute probably resembling seawater millennia of years ago when terrestrial animals evolved out of sea. So, while we have sodium chloride at 140 millimolar, marine animals have an extracellular fluid with 440 millimolar sodium chloride which is similar to the seawater of today. So, Hodgkin and Katz were able to put in microelectrodes into the squid giant axon and as they changed sodium concentration outside by diluting seawater not just with water but with another solution which would have an equivalent of sodium to adjust for osmolarity like choline or glucose or sucrose compounds which would not go through channels. So, when they maintained osmolarity but changed the concentration of sodium outside they noticed that the height of the action potential reduced. This was proof enough that the action potential was a case where the membrane was moving towards the sodium equilibrium potential because it became overtly permeable to sodium much in excess of its potassium permeability. Hodgkin and Huxley made prolific contributions. They are credited with developing the voltage clamp technique along with others wherein the voltage of a cell could be maintained at a desired value for a length of time so that the currents that develop during that voltage clamp can be studied better. It helps us understand channel kinetics better. Even today their paradigm is repeated across the labs in the world where voltage is clamped to measure currents or current is clamped to measure voltage. Hodgkin and Huxley also developed the HH model a set of mathematical equations describing how sodium or potassium sodium and potassium channels should behave in terms of their activation and inactivation. They developed those equations and made those predictions purely based on their electrical measurements and for their phenomenal contribution to scientific knowledge Hodgkin and Huxley were awarded the Nobel Prize in 1963 jointly with Sir J C Eccles. The HH model is something that you would want to learn about. A discussion on the HH model is beyond the scope of this class. You could refer other sources to understand the HH model. To summarize now Bernstein was entirely correct when he stated the cause of the resting membrane potential as the potassium equilibrium potential. But his assumption that there was an indiscriminate membrane breakdown or an increase in permeability to all ions during the passage of an action potential was not right because the membrane during an action potential became selectively permeable for sodium and the increase in sodium conductance was so much 
that any resting potassium conductance would become inconsequential. And therefore, the membrane reached the sodium equilibrium potential. Did it quite reach the sodium equilibrium potential? Not really. For those concentrations of sodium inside and outside, the sodium equilibrium potential would have been plus 60. But we see that the action potential peak never reaches the sodium equilibrium potential. It stops short. We will see why shortly. So during an action potential, the membrane moves towards the sodium equilibrium potential because it has become overtly permeable to sodium. Let us look at where these channels are placed in the table that we've seen earlier. Yes. For nerve cells, the only constitutively open channels are these. And the leak channels are responsible for the resting membrane potential of the cell. And the upstroke of the action potential is due to voltage-gated sodium channels. Now there's something else to clarify. The resting membrane potential, let us say, is at minus 70 millivolts. Dr. Vina has told you that the threshold voltage for opening voltage-gated sodium channels is actually minus 55 millivolts. Only when the membrane reaches minus 55 millivolts, voltage-gated sodium channels will open and the membrane will move towards the equilibrium potential for sodium, which is about plus 60 millivolts. But how does the membrane depolarize initially to reach minus 55 millivolts? We can call this initial depolarization the foot of the action potential. The channels that are responsible for the foot of the action potential, we can identify in this table as this group here, which are either non-specific monovalent cation channels or non-specific cation channels. Now this class, these are ligand gated channels and this class of channels have other mechanisms of gating, composite mechanisms of gating. Some of them can even be just mechanosensitive. Touch receptors have mechanosensitive channels which open up when you touch the skin and those are non-specific cation channels. Two types of tissues have this contour of action potential, neurons and skeletal muscle. In both those, the rest of the events are similar. The resting potential is due to constitutively open potassium channels. Upstroke of the action potential is due to voltage sensitive um, sodium channels. Repolarization is due to voltage-gated potassium channels, but the foot of the action potential or the early depolarization differs from tissue to tissue. In the sensory neuron, the channels responsible for this section are different. They are different in motor neurons and they are different in the skeletal muscle. In the next session, we will discuss which of these non-specific channels, cation channels, are involved in the early depolarization of sensory neurons, motor neurons and skeletal muscles. We will also discuss a little more about the kinetics of voltage-gated sodium channels and the voltage-gated potassium channels, otherwise referred to as delayed rectifiers. Thank you for choosing to watch this NPTEL lecture.